everyone. Why don't we get started? Let's stand and we'll talk to our Father. Lord, we, we're here again tonight and we come into your house with thanksgiving and praise for what you're doing in our lives and who you are to us. And we ask, Lord, that you would come and inhabit the praises of your people, that you would fill our hearts, our lives again. We need you. We are nothing without you. And you are everything, Lord. And so we want to worship you tonight with our, with our hearts, with our voices. We want to hear from your word. We praise you in Jesus' name. Like a river glorious Is God's perfect peace Over all victorious In its bright increase Perfect yet it floweth Fuller every day Perfect yet someone. Shame. 
My sin weighed upon your shoulder, my soul now to stand. What can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me. This life to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. So what can I say? What can I do? sacrifice to you, Lord. There is none like you, Lord, mighty God, everlasting Father, our Savior. We stand before you, Lord, our hearts open, our hands raised, Lord. We praise you, Father. There is none above you. High and lifted up, our God, our God reigns. Hallelujah. Amen. And Father, tonight we know that you know what we need to hear tonight, Lord God. You know, Father, the things we'll face this week, Lord, on Thursday and Friday, and even this evening, Lord, as we leave this place. 
And Father, we always need your wisdom, we need your understanding, we need your knowledge, Lord God. We are not the brightest light, Father, in the decorations. We, Father, need more, more of you, God. So, Lord, teach us tonight, Lord God, and make our hearts attentive to your word, God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the book of Proverbs tonight. If you've got your Bibles, chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. A former park ranger at Yellowstone National Park tells the story of a ranger leading a group of hikers to a fire lookout. The ranger was so intent on telling the hikers about the flowers and the animals that he considered the message on his two-way radio distracting, so he switched it off. Nearing the tower, the ranger was met by a nearly breathless lookout who asked why he hadn't responded to the message on his radio. A grizzly bear had been stalking the group and the authorities were trying to warn them out of the danger. Anytime we tune our message, God has sent us. We put a peril not only ourselves, but all those around us. How important it is that we never turn off God's saving communication. We have been talking about the Holy Spirit on Sundays some and the importance. And the Holy Spirit makes the Word of God alive and He teaches us and He gives us wisdom, reveals things, and He warns us in many places. And the Holy Spirit will warn us, but we can't turn Him off. In our class last night, our discipleship class, we learned that there are three things you can do to the Holy Spirit. You can grieve Him, you can quench Him, and you can resist Him. And let me tell you, you don't want to do any of those things. But you want to be attentive to him because there are things that he wants to speak to you. It's so nice to know that we have an intercom, so to say, within our hearts that the Holy Spirit can speak to us. But we have to be willing to listen and be open. I've learned, and let me share this and then we'll go into the chapter. You never stop learning. If you do, you're in trouble. More learning concerning God, especially, is like oil that greases the wheel, lubes it, and makes it run a lot smoother. Think about this. How many wish you knew what you know now 40 years ago or 30 years ago? We all do, huh? We all do. So we never stop learning, we never stop growing. Let's start on verse 1. This is a really good chapter. As I was studying it, there's a lot of things the Lord reminded me of for my own personal life and for you. Verse 1 says, And these are the prophets of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, copied. So we kind of see a break from the, all the other chapters, and we begin to see a time when our period of time of about 240 years now have passed by from chapter 24 to chapter 25. So in other words, all the other chapters were written by Solomon, and this one is, is written by Solomon also, but what happened is they only had 24 chapters evidently, and then King Hezekiah becomes king about 240 years later, and he finds a lot of, or the priest finds a lot of more scriptures that Solomon has written, so he puts them together, his men puts them together, and these are the ones that he puts together in the next, like, five chapters. Well, I thought that was kind of interesting to know. So we're about 250 years later after Solomon in, when this chapter starts. And this is what it says in verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. I want to read a different translation to you. 
God is honored for what he keeps secret. Kings are honored for what they discover. This is the most awesome and the only Bible, or only book that God has given us. We call it the Bible. In it, we can search for God, we can search for answers, and God wants to reveal things to us constantly. We don't earn his blessings. We are saved by the grace of God. But there are things that God says, I've hidden things, and I want you to hunt for them. And let me tell you why God wants us to hunt, uh, hunt for them, because God wants us to put some effort forward. God wants to reveal truth to us, but we have to do some work of our own. If you go into, let's say, this verse right here, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. If you look up the word concealed, most of you probably know what it means. But it, when you look up each word, each individual word, you, you begin to see what God is putting together and you begin to see a deeper understanding and have a deeper understanding of the word of God. This word not only means to conceal, but it means to hide, that God literally hides things. It's kind of like, a, don't misunderstand me when I say this. God wants you to understand him. He wants you to know. But there are certain things that are hidden, like an egg hunt. There's one golden egg, and there's a lot more golden, other eggs out there on the egg hunt. There's white and blue and green, and there's a silver one who gets a small basket, and then there's a big golden one who gets a big basket. That's kind of how it works. God hides things, and he wants them to you to know them, but you have to search for them. You have to seek for them. You have to put some effort forward to know the things that God wants you to know. Now, there's going to be times that you see people and you see that they understand the scripture so much better than you do. Or they'll quote a scripture and you'll go, man, and you get envious. Let me tell you, that didn't just happen. All of a sudden, they don't have this great memory. I'm one of those guys who do not have a great memory. But I've learned to memorize scripture. I run it over in my mind and I meditate on it and God reveals many things to me. But the thing is, is this. It takes effort. It's funny. Sometimes people think that the Bible, when they read it, it's like a lottery. You just buy a ticket and maybe, just maybe, you might win. So, but you only have one, one in a quadrillion, if there's such a word, a chance of winning. You have more chance of winning, in this, of getting struck by lightning than you do winning the lottery. My point is, the more you seek God, the more God will reveal to you. That's what God requires. God has those things concealed. And if you see somebody else that is more spiritual, not more holier than thou, but more spiritual, more understanding, have more peace and rest, you don't have to be envious of, of them in any way. But you can't expect the same thing from the person who goes out and plants one seed in the ground and then gets one little teeny tomato plant and he gets five tomatoes, and you're envious of someone who goes out and digs, and he has 50 plants, and he has all these tomatoes. You can't be envious of them. You can either say, okay, I need to plant a lot more seeds. I have to do a lot more work. I have to put a lot more effort into it. That's how it works. Now, verse 3 changes the subject again. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of a king is unsearchable. So in other words, what it's saying is that the heart of man, or the, the ruler in this sense, a king, authority, one in authority, that their hearts are unsearchable. I thought about this. 
And the scripture really teaches that every heart or every person has a heart, a trouble searching his own heart. And we have trouble searching the hearts of others. Now look at me. How many have ever said this? I know exactly what their motive is. I know exactly what they're thinking. I know exactly what's in their heart. And maybe you might get lucky and guess it and say, you're right. <laughs> but most of the time, you're wrong. I have a problem searching my own heart. There are times when I come in here, or I'm at home, or really, when I ride my bike, I've been doing that lately, and as I ride my bike, this is what I do. I spend time with God. It's just me and God. My wife and I, we walk in the morning together, and we pray together. But when I'm riding my bike, it's just me and the Lord. I have a double seat. No, just kidding. <laughs> just one seat. I ride, he walks. My point is, I have a special time with God. And in that time, I ask God to search my heart, to see if there be anything in there, because God, I'm not able to really search my heart. My, the Bible says the heart is wicked and desperate. Who can know it? That too. <laughs> my point is, we don't know our hearts. Our hearts can deceive us. And we don't know other people's heart. Well, I know why they did that. I know you don't know. And it's better that you don't know. I, I have a problem knowing my own heart in the sense of some of the things that are bad. I know sometimes my heart is wicked. So I don't want to really know about their wickedness. I already know about my own. So be careful in the sense of searching other people's heart. Search your own, and that's good enough. No. Verse 4 says, take away the dross from silver. This is what we call the purifying process of silver. The dross are the bad in ingredients in silver itself. And it will go to the silversmith or jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king and his throne will be established in righteousness. So when it mentions king, it's talking about people in authority. It could be the president. It could be a governor. It can be a mayor. But the main thing it's talking about is purifying those people who are in authority or have something to say in the sense of they have some kind of power. Let's use our city council for example. We have five members on our city council of Clear Lake, including our mayor. If that mayor decides, you know, he's a Christian and he wants to do what God wants him to do, what he's gonna do, he's gonna begin to purify, take away those that dross, and really he can't do this because these people are voted in, but he can do a process and hopefully pray and get rid of those who are evil. Now, I'm not saying our city council is evil. That's not what I'm saying. I don't know if they are or not. I'm giving an, using it for an example. But I do know what God says, that when a leader purifies those under him, literally, the Bible says, his throne will be established in righteousness and what is right. The people will be blessed under him. Our church is the same way, no different. We have a leadership. We have a, a board of elders. We have a, a group of men and women in our congregation that help make decisions, decisions where we spend money, things that we want to do. And there are no evil men and women in our leadership at all. Thank God. I say that with confidence. And God wants to do right things, and God will do right things. And we're very blessed. I want to read a different translation. She was the same thought, same scripture. Removing impurities from the silver, and the silversmith can find 
craft a fine chalice. Remove the wicked from the leadership and the authority will be credible and God-honoring. Isn't that what we want? Amen. Verse 6. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. Or the word exalt can mean boast also. And do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that they say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince, whom you, whose your eyes have seen. So do not exalt yourself. Don't put yourself in the place of exaltation, but be humble and sit at a lower place. Because if you sit in the wrong place, you're going to be embarrassed big time when that person who's in, supposed to be sitting in your place comes and you're asked to go sit in a different place than a lower place where you should be. Now, here's what Jesus said. You're in your bidding to come to a feast. Don't go and take the most honorable table and the honorable chair. Sit in a lesser place. It's much, much better to have the host come and say to you, oh, come up and sit up here, rather than to be sitting in the place of prominence. And the host comes up and says, you're in the wrong place. Please sit down there. That describes it pretty well. Now, verse 25, I'm sorry, verse 8 through 10 begins to speak about going to court. How many of you ever had to go to court? Raise your hand. A few of you. I think it's one of the most miserable things to do. I've had to go, uh, let's see, one, two, two times to court. And I can't wait to get out of there. But court is not something that's very comfortable. And God speaks to us about court. Listen to what it says in verse 8. Do not be hasty to hastily go to court. Or what will you do in the end? When your neighbor has put you to shame, debate your case with your neighbor, and do not disclose a secret to another. Let's see who hears it, exposes your shame and your reputation be ruined. The Bible teaches here how to deal with the problem. To go to that person and speak with them instead of going to court. I'm just going to sue you and get it over with. It's not like, it. it's not that easy. It's better that you go and you talk with them face to face and you deal with it that way and you settle it that way. It also says do not disclose the secret to another. In other words, don't talk to your neighbor about your problem that you have with somebody else. So I want to give you an example because I think this could happen in church. You borrow money from somebody in the church which, let me say this, it really shouldn't be. If you're going to borrow money and you're going to be a lender, it should be given with the same thought of not getting it back. That's what Scripture teaches. So yeah, I might be borrowing money from each of you tonight. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but my point is, if you borrow from someone money and they can't pay you back yet when they're supposed to pay you back, they're a month or two months or three months late, and so you're upset about it, and you decide you're going to go to your friend and talk to them about it because they need to know so that they, they can also have a problem with that same person. They need to know so they can be poisoned. I know we don't look at it like that, but really that's exactly what's happening. And the Bible calls that really 
gossip or slander. It can be both or one or the other. The Bible teaches us that if we have a problem, go and deal with that person specifically. And that's the only person you should talk to, period. Nobody else. You can also use the excuse, well, I just needed counsel. Or you can use the excuse, I need to get it off my chest and put it on somebody else's. <laughs> that's not good. So it says don't go to court hastily. And it warns us about being careful about making quick judgments about things. Sometimes things aren't always as they seem. Let me share this true story with you. Two men, both seriously ill, occupied the same hospital room. One man was allowed to sit up in the bed for an hour a day to drain the fluid from his lungs. His bed was next to the room's only window. The other man had to spend all the time flat on his back. The men talked for an hour, on, hours on end. They spoke of their wives, their families, their homes, their jobs, their involvements in military service, when they'd be, where they'd been on vacation. Every afternoon when the man in bed next to the window sits up, he would pass the time and entertain both of them by describing to his roommate all the things he could see outside the window. The man in the other bed would really live for those one-hour periods. His world would be broadened and enlivened by the activity and the color of the outside world described by his new friend. His description of his new perspective were great. The window overlooked a park with lovely lake and ducks and swans. Some children sailed their model boats. The park of the flowers of every color of the rainbow and the grand old trees, the squirrels played the, their game. There was a fine view of the city skyline in the distance. <coughs> Excuse me. As the man by the window described all this, the man on the other side of the room would close his eyes and imagine the picturesque scene. Are you getting the picture? One warm afternoon, the man by the window described the wedding party taking pictures on the lovely park below. Later, the parade passed by. Evidently, a circus was coming to town and told about the elephants holding each other's tail as they made their way down the street. Although the other man could not hear the band, he could see it in his eyes, his mind's eye. Then an alien thought, an alien thought entered his head. Why should this guy have all the pleasure of seeing everything while I never get to see anything? It didn't seem fair. As a thought for a minute, the man felt ashamed at first. But as time passed, his envy eroded and resentment and soon turned into him sour. He began to brood and he found himself unable to sleep. He should be by that window, and that thought now controlled his life. Late one night, as he lay staring at the ceiling, the man by the window began to cough. He was choking on fluid in his lungs. The man watched in his dimly lit room as a struggling man by the window groped for the button to call for help. Listening from across the room, he never moved. He never pushed his button, which would have brought the nurse running. In less than five minutes, the coughing and choking stopped, along with the sound of breathing. Now there was only silence, deathly silence. The following morning, that day, the nurse arrived in bringing water for the baths. She found the lifeless body of the man by the window, and he was taken away. As soon as it seemed appropriate, the man asked if he could be moved next to the window. The nurse was happy to make the switch, and after making sure he was comfortable, she left him alone. Slowly, painfully, he propped himself up on his elbows to take his first look. Finally, he would have the joy of seeing it all himself. He strained too slowly to look out the window besides the bed. It faced a blank, bare wall. Beloved, sometimes we get angry at people because things we become suspicious of. 
I'm finding that I can be quickly or quick about drawing too much from my suspicions. I'm often wrong and I'm a fool to put too much weight on my own suspicions. A sad story, huh? He goes on in verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in the settings of silver. Have you noticed that some people, I really believe that they're led by the Spirit of God, say the right things just at the right time. They're the perfect thing that need to be heard. And the words that they say bring life. Now, there are going to be times when you need to say the right thing and it can diffuse the whole situation that someone is in. You know, the world tells us to be silent. In a moment, we're going to talk about self-control. It's at the very end of the chapter, really. And I believe that the older you get, the quieter you become. That doesn't mean you never talk. But you have less to say because you know what you used to say was not beneficial. And unless you have something good to say and right to say, you don't want to say it. Because you know it will bear fruit, whether it be good or whether it be bad. But our world tells us to be silent. Don't say anything. Don't rock the boat. Don't move anything. Don't do anything. Just be silent and go along with what's going on. Now, God never wants us to be obnoxious or be rude or be mean or be a Mr. Know-it-all. God doesn't want that. But there are times and situations and circumstances when God says, I want you to say something. Well, where's pastor? Let him, say, let him say it. He can say it. I'm not there, but you're there. And God wants you to say something. But what about if it's my kids? I, want, I love my kids. I don't want to say anything to my kids because if I say something to my kids, they may not love me no more. If you're not saying something to them that is right and true because you love them, and they don't want to say anything, you don't want to say anything because of that because it might harm your relationship, there's something wrong with that relationship. We should be able to be honest with our kids in anything we say as long as it's done with love on our part. If there's ever been a word that needs to be spoken, that will be apples of gold or in settings of silver, the perfect word, it's now. Verse 12, different subject, as earrings of gold and ornaments of fine gold, as a wise rebuker to an, Ill, Ill, to an obedient ear. Different translation. Valid criticism is as treasured by the one who heeds it as jewelry made from five gold, fine gold. So valid criticism is as treasure. I have found it to be true in my own personal life that God is not finished working in me. In the book of Philippians 1, 6, it says, He who began a good work is able to complete it until the return of Christ. As I'm getting older, I'm realizing God's still working. God hasn't stopped. And sometimes God uses people, and sometimes God uses valid criticism. But am I open to it? And if I am open to it, and the Bible says, uh, my ear will be one of obedience. When was the last time when someone said something to you that was valid, and you know it was valid, that you said, thank you, I accept that as from the Lord, and what you're saying is true, I'll do something with that. Did 
this word obedient ear means to be one who listens, one who hears, and one who does something with it. An obedient ear receives the precepts of a wise reprover and wears them like an ornament. Let's go to the next one. Like the cold snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him, for he refreshes the soul of his master. Different translation. Faithful messengers are as refreshing as snow in the heat of summer. They receive the spirit of their employer, or they revive the spirit of their employer. I'm sorry. So God wants us to be, in this text, in the different translation, to be a faithful employee. And I want to read a scripture to you. This is in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. And here's what it says about employees. And we're all employees of God. Servants, obey in all things your masters, your employer, according to the flesh, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus. But he that does wrong shall receive from the, for the wrong which he has done, and there is no respecter of persons. This word faithful, because it's mentioned here, a faithful messenger is one that is, stands firm, one that is trusted, one to be certain. So he performs what he's supposed to do. And because of it, he refreshes his master's soul. He brings a faithful message that the master sent him. Now, the Bible gives us a spiritual understanding of this also. You all have been sent to be messengers of God, ambassadors of God, representing God. And the message is the gospel. I'm going to share this Sunday because I felt like the Lord shared this, showed to me this as I was studying for Sunday. So on Sunday, I'm going to repeat it because it, was, it, it just went to, the, to my quick and my heart. Imagine that you have cancer. And you go to God and you say, God, heal me. And God instantly heals you. But God doesn't stop there. He says, I'm going to give you the gift of healing. And you're going to be able to heal anyone of cancer, just like you had. All you have to do is share this truth, and that person will be healed just like you. But you decide, I don't want no one. I want everybody to be healed, but I don't want to tell anybody about this. I don't mind telling about me being healed, but I'm really not concerned about everybody else. My main concern is about me being healed. Now, in your thoughts, you'd think, I know, because I thought the same thing. How selfish and how self-centered can you be? Your God has healed you, and God's given you the gift of being able to share with others that can be healed too. And there's an analogy here. Every one of you have been healed by God from your cancer called sin. God has totally taken away your sin and healed, healed you. Before you, you are completely innocent before God. God sees you as perfect. You're not, but God sees you that way. And God has forgiven you everything there is. 
And many Christians, they just kind of hoard it and say, oh, God's healed me. That's all that matters. I'm going to heaven. And they don't share how God wants to heal others. And it's really, don't get, wrong, don't get mad at me, but it's really selfish and self-centered. The illustration I gave you is literally exactly what you're doing. You see, God has given us a message, and God wants us to be faithful to that message, to giving that message out. Now let's go to the next one. Verse 14, whoever falsely boasts of giving is like the clouds of wind without rain. So it begins to speak about, it can be two things. Number one, it can be somebody who considers himself generous and makes a promise and says, I'll help, I'll be there, I'll do that, I'll give you this if I need it, and doesn't do it when his need is there. A lot of people think they're generous, but they really aren't. Generous means I'm giving for the needs or the helping of other people. And God wants us to be generous because God has been generous with us. The Bible speaks in the book of Jude about the same thought about it was like clouds of wind without rain. And it speaks about really false teachers who are like that. Who come in like winds come in, but when the clouds come in, the clouds pass over and they don't leave any rain. They make all these promises but none of those promises are fulfilled because they're false promises. I say that with this thought in mind, be careful of false doctrine. Be careful of false te teaching. Be careful of claiming and naming it, faith movement. Those are false doctrines. I could go for hours on that same teaching, but that's not what I want to do tonight. So let me say this to you before we go on. Don't say nothing that you won't do. Don't say nothing that you won't do. There are people that have been on their deathbed that I've been there, and they have asked me, please take care of either it's their wife or children, and sometimes I won't say nothing because you know what? I won't do that on some instances. Let me tell you why. Because sometimes their children are so out, way out there and they want me to reel them back in and help, and I can't. I'm not gonna lie and say, hey, I'll do whatever I need to take to reach out for those kids. I will salvation-wise, but I can't change what they put into their kids for 20 years. They're a mess. I'll help in any way I can. But there's others been that, who have asked me, please take care of my wife, and we do. As a church, we will help and we'll take care of their needs in any way we can. I can do that, and I can be true to the commitment. My point in saying that is be careful of what you commit to and you say you're going to do. That's what the Bible says, do not make, what is it called, oaths? Okay. Now, verse 15. By forbearance, our patience, our calmness, that's what the word means, a ruler is persuaded. And a gentle tongue can break a bone. So it would be really a soft tongue or a soft answer. There's an Arab saying, the tongue has no bones, but it breaks many bones.
There's a Turkish saying that says this, the tongue has no bones, but it crushes. Gentleness and kindness overcome the most powerful and the obstinate. We can influence people with patience and kindness. That is God's heart. I don't know if you've noticed it, but the Bible speaks a lot about the tongue. Have you noticed? James speaks about it being a deadly weapon, and it can be poison. Or it can bring life. It can, it can also bring life, but it can also bring death. I like the life part. Verse 16, have you found honey? Eat as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and you vomit. In other words, what it's saying is don't overindulge in anything. Because they'll be counterproductive. In other words, you eat too much, you're going to throw up. Honey was somewhat of a staple in the Old Testament. It was food. And they needed that food. Verse 17, seldom set your foot in your, your neighbor's house, lest he become weary of you and hate you. I like what one commentator says. It said, make thy foot preciously rare. Don't abuse hospitality. So in other words, it's okay to go to your, na your neighbors and it's okay to go to a Christian friend's house. Just don't overdo it because you will make it, them weary of you. And it says here that it'll hate you. That's not what it's talking about. It's not literally, they're going to hate you. It's feelings of strong antagonism and dislike. In other words, the relationship is going to be injured if you're always over somebody's house. Now, that doesn't mean don't have anybody over your house either. That's, you've got to be careful. There has to be a balance. Verse 18. A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. Okay, let me ask you a question. How many have ever felt like they've been clubbed by somebody who's lied? Are they been hit with the sword, sliced and diced? Are they been hit with a sharp arrow? Let me give you a different translation. Telling lies about others is harmful as hitting them with an axe, wounding them with a sword, and shooting them with a sharp arrow. So it does bad against when a person lies, the person that's lied against. It feels like they've been hit like that. I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, I don't want to know what they say because I don't want to be poisoned. But I, they'll tell you, well, they said stuff bad against me and they're crying and, and they're hurt. And you can see the damage is done. He goes on, and we've talked about that enough. Verse 19, confidence in an unfaithful man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. So in other words, if you have a bad tooth and you go to chew some steak, <laughs> it's not going to work very well, is it? If you have a bad foot and you go to run, you're in trouble. And when you put your confidence in an unfaithful man, the Bible teaches this is exactly what's going to happen. How do I know if a man is faithful? How can I know if a, you can rely on a man in the sense of helping or in a need? Or Let me tell you something that you need to know. Time is the only one that can tell you that. Because people can pretend for a period of time and put on the dog, so to say. <laughs> but time always tells how faithful that person is. 
And I'll say this, we have a lot of faithful people in our body, a lot of faithful people, and I'm thankful to God. But God has made them faithful. They have yielded to God, and God has made them faithful. Now, verse 20. Like one who is, takes away a garment in the cold, and like vinegar on soda, and one is one who sings a song to a heavy heart. Could you imagine singing a song to someone who's just lost a loved one? That's kind of like what it's saying. The Bible teaches that we need to weep with those who weep and sing with those who sing. Probably one of the hardest things at times is to comfort somebody who's lost somebody that they love. And I've always tried to think, well, what am I going to say? Especially as a young pastor, I used to think, I don't know what to say. And one time I heard the Lord speak to me. He said, don't say anything. Just cry with him. Weep with him. Put your arms around him and love him. You ain't got to say one word. And that was the most comforting thing that I've used and I've... Uh, that I can use in the sense of helping people when something hard that they're facing as Christians. Now, verse 21, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he is thirsty, give him water to drink, or so you heap up coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, in the Old Testament, if you remember correctly, used to be an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In other words, if you hit me, I'm going to hit you. I get to hit you back. Whatever you give me, I'm going to give back to you. But Jesus speaks totally different. I want to read to you. This is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, and it says this. You have heard that it was said, and he's quoting from the Old Testament here. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collector do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect or mature, just as your Father in his heaven is perfect. This word enemy means adversary or foe or refers to those whose actions and words manifest hatred for you. Have you ran into anybody lately like that? If not, you will. It can be the in-laws that will not speak to you, the associates who try to get you fired. We are called to love those filled with animosity toward us. Now, let me say this to you before we go on. You can't do this in your own ability. You can't do this in walking in your flesh because if you walk in your flesh, you're going to be offended and you're going to react and do the exact same thing that you don't want to do. You can only do this as you yield to the Spirit of God. Now, Jesus leaves no speculation in this passage. Commanding love for those who hate, despise, despise and persecute us. Such love is only possible through the power of Jesus Christ, who, who himself loved in that way, and now seeks vessels through whom to love again. The hate-filled who assail him as they oppose you. In the book of Romans, we learned that God has shed his love abroad in our hearts, so we are able to love. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have ever carried a grudge? I'll raise my hand for all of us. Not, I don't think I've done that much since I've been a Christian. 
But let me read this to you. It's by Dr. Essa E. McMillan. And he illustrates in a chapter entitled, The High Cost of Getting Even. And from his book, it goes like this. None of these diseases, how physical maladies included ulcers, high blood pressure, strokes, are connected to harboring resentment and hatred toward others. He says it might be written on many thousands of death certificates that the victim died of grudgititis. It's not a word, but he uses that word. Dr. McMillan describes how hating a person enslaves the one who hates. The moment I start hating a man, I become his slave. I cannot enjoy my work anymore because he even controls my thoughts. My resentments produce too many stress hormones in my body. I become fatigued after only a few hours of work. The man I hate may be miles from my bedroom, but more cruel than any slave driver, he whips my thoughts into a, such a frenzy that my inner spring mattress becomes a rack of torture. I really must acknowledge that I am a slave to every man on whom I pour out my wrath. I read that with this thought in mind. God doesn't want us to hold grudges. God wants us to forgive, no matter what they've done. It doesn't mean they're right what they've done. It doesn't mean that what they did to you was okay. God doesn't okay sin. God deals with sin himself. But what he does do is he wants the effects of sin not to affect our lives and our hearts. And when we grudge or begrudging to people or we hold resentment and we don't forgive, it's poisoning us. I don't care who you are. Like he said, there could be thousands and thousands of people that are dead on the death certificate that says it could say grudging. They grudged had grudges against other people. This is what killed them. Verse 23, and we're almost done. The north wind brings forth rain, and a backbiting tongue, an angry countenance. A backbiting tongue speaks about secret slander. It'll destroy relationships. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you, then we'll go right into the next one. Psalm 15, 1, 2, 3. Is, we shall abide in the tabernacle. This is the Psalm of David. We shall dwell in the holy hill. He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor, nor makes or takes up a reproach against his neighbor. Romans 1.30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, revenge of evil, things disobedient to parents. These are people who the Bible says that God deals with. 1 Peter 2.1, wherefore lay aside all malice and guile and hypocrisy and envy and all evil speaking, talking about backbiting, 2 Corinthians 20, 12, 20. For I fear lest that when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I should be found unto you such as would not, lest there be debates, envy, and wrath, strife, backbiting, whispering, swellings, and turmoil. And the last one, James 4, 11. Speak no evil one. Do not speak evil one of another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother judges his brother and speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Aesop, the ancient storyteller, told this fable. Once upon a time, a donkey found a lion's skin. He tried it on, strutted around, and frightened many animals. Soon the fox came along, and the donkey tried to scare him too. But the fox, hearing the donkey's voice, said, If you want to terrify me, you'll have to disguise your bray. Aesop's moral. Clothes may disguise a fool, but his words will give him away. 
Verse 24. It is, very <laughs> it is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than a house shared with a contentious woman. Amen. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> Verse 25. As cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. I think that's pretty easy. Verse 26, a righteous man. There's two more scriptures that we want to center on and then we're done. A righteous man falters, who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring and a polluted well. Different translations. If the godly compromises with the wicked, it is like polluting a fountain and muddying the spring. The Bible gives many different illustrations of this. The Bible teaches that we are righteous. The Bible teaches that God wants us to walk in righteousness. Do what's right. Apply the word to your life. Live the way God wants you to live. Think the way God wants you to think. All in the power of the Holy Spirit and God's ability and God's working. This is how God wants us to be. I know what's right and so do you. And that's how God wants me to live. But what can happen is the wicked can come in and influence me or intimidate me in some way or another and it can cause me to yield to it and stop my righteousness in that area. And the Bible teaches what happens literally and there's a lot of murky Christians today who have compromised and that's what the word means too is that they're compromising what they know is against God and the opposite of what God says. As a Christian, I am not to compromise, but I am also not to be self-righteous and s s arrogant in the sense of, oh, I'm, I'm not... God says, no, God wants me to be humble. God wants me to meek, be meek and lowly. Every Christian, God wants us to be that way, but he doesn't want to us to compromise. The church today, the body of Christ, and many churches, not all of them, some have paid true to the word, but many of them are in this murky water where they compromise what they know the word of God says is right. God says this is right because it's going to bring death. And if we compromise, we're going along with untruths that will bring death, whether they be our children, whether they be whoever they may be, they're going to affect. And it's not easy to stand and be true to what you truly believe, what the scripture says. But there's ever been a time that we need to stand it today, if not, the, the world is in trouble because we're the only hope that the world has, the church, the body of Christ. Let me read to you in a different translation. If the godly compromises with the wicked, it is like polluting a fountain and muddy in the sp springs. Verse 27, it is not good to eat too much honey. To seek one's own glory is not glory. In other words, don't be conceited or self-absorbed or exaggerated about your own opinion of yourself. And the last one, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broke down without walls. I memorized this scripture for myself a long, long time ago. And every time I read it, I read it once a month, and I memorize it, and I re read it three or four different times, and then I meditate on it, because I believe that it's completely important for my life, every single day of my life, and it's important for your life. Let me explain it to you. The word rule means to have control. Your spirit is your temper, your anger, your impatience, your unaccountability or your uncontrollable impulse. Now, how good are you in the sense of self-control? A man that has no rule over his own spirit, a man who is always losing his temper, is like a defenseless city. 
a city that is broken down without walls. And let me say this to you, they're open to captivity. I can captivate every one of you if you do not have control. I can say something to you that will make you lose your control if you do not have the Spirit of God leading you in the sense of you yielding to the Spirit of God because control or self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And I've seen so many people captivated, even by their children, because they don't have self-control. A city without walls is a city vulnerable to attack. In ancient days, one of the things a conquering army would do was to tear down the walls of the city it had just conquered. This would keep the people defenseless from the further attacks from them. This would keep the city from rebelling against the conquered king. When we are lacking self-control, we are vulnerable to the enemy's attack. So how do I cultivate self-control? It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in my life is self-control. I need to make a, make a point of yielding myself to the Holy Spirit, and these things He wants to do in my life will be done. Emerson made this statement, a man is a hero, not because he's braver than anyone else, but because he is brave for 10 minutes longer. So God wants us to be people who walk in the sense of the Holy Spirit, who has a control of self. If not, you're gonna be captivated. I'll end with this thought. I used to have a temper, a bad temper. It's been years. But I had a bad temper, and I would get hot, man, right away. And the reason I had that bad temper is because I had unforgiveness in my heart toward a certain person, my father. I'll say it that way. Nobody has any things. That, well, I wonder who it was. So it was my father. He was very abusive. So I had unforgiveness for him, and so that I had, did not have self-control. After I became a Christian, God began to work this in my heart, and he's continued to work it in my heart. But without having self-control, the enemy is going to captivate you. Our people can captivate you also. So we need to yield to the Spirit of God concerning allowing Him to bring forth the fruit of self-control, control of self. Father, we are grateful for the Word of God today, Lord God. And there are many things you've taught us, Lord, you've reminded us of, you've shown us, Lord. And the reason why you've shown these things is because you love us and you want our life to be blessed. Some of the things we've learned, God, are not only for us, they're for others to pass it on to, Lord God. Yes, us first and then others too, God. So I pray that the Word of God would go deep within our hearts and produce the fruit that, that you desire, Lord. And Lord, I want to pray for the fruit of your Spirit in the sense of self-control. Father, if there's one who does not have control of their spirit, May they yield and surrender themselves to you tonight, Lord God, in that area. And may you produce by the Holy Spirit that lives in them, Lord, the fruit of self-control, Lord God. If, Father, they have unforgiveness or someone, Lord, may tonight, may they forgive as they've been forgiven. And, Father, may you be glorified through it. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen.